All right, here we go. So you may have noticed in this series uh, that we're not doing a translation here of Matthew, of the book of Matthew. We are doing a comparison study. More than that, but mostly a comparison study of Hebrew Matthew against Greek Matthew. Along the way, I will point out various passages in Matthew that I think are, are of interest. So we're starting now on chapter 2. This is from the English translation of Hebrew Matthew. It says, It came to pass, when Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of Herod the king, behold, astrologers, that's how they translate that word, astrologers came from the east to Jerusalem. In the Greek New Testament, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east, to Jerusalem. So which one do you think is more accurate? Why is that? Oh, Hebrew Matthew. Because it comes from the Hebrew, right? It goes from Hebrew, from Hebrew to the English. Where it is Greek, uh, Matthew goes from Hebrew to Aramaic to Greek to English. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, it, it makes sense that uh, Hebrew Matthew is going to be more accurate. But one may ask, Weren't they wise men? What's wrong with saying they're wise men? They were wise. You couldn't be an astrologer, and we'll talk about that word astrologer in a moment. You couldn't be an astrologer from the school of Daniel. Remember, this is where they came from. Remember the Magi teaching? We said they came from, from Daniel's school. You couldn't come from that school and not be wise. You'd be vetted. Somebody else here? You might remember in the series I did on the so-called wise men that they were from the school that Daniel pioneered many, many years before this in Daniel chapter 6. So yes, they were wise, but more accurately, more accurately, they were astrologers. But let's talk about the Hebrew word being used here for astrologers. In Isaiah 47, this is the word translated as astrologer. Hachuzim, Hachuzim, the astrologers. The same word is used in Hebrew Matthew, but it is spelled slightly different, but it is pronounced the exact same way. This is a screenshot from Hebrew Matthew. So, Chuzim, Chuzim. Let's compare them. Okay. So this is the way it was in Isaiah on the bottom. So it says, ha chozim. What does ha mean? The, the or the, right? So let's take out the ha, see what we're left with. Chozim. But they still look different, don't they? We still have a difference. One has the letter vav and the other doesn't. You guys know the letter vav on here? Here, let me see if I can... So, ouch, there's the Vav, there's no Vav here. But this is the same, this is the same, this is the same, this is the same. Now I want to refer to our Hebrew students. If you have a dot next to a letter, other than a sheen or shin, right? What letter are you supposed to imagine under that dot? The Vav. You're supposed to imagine a vav there, right? And yes, it makes an O sound. So, one spelled the word chosim differently than the other, but they're pronounced exactly the same way. In both places, in Hebrew Matthew and in Isaiah, both of these words are translated as astrologers. Okay? I'm showing you this so that we are all clear that this is the same word, and any Hebrew speaker would agree with this. But now I want to show you what that word actually means. And I can do that by showing you what it says in the Hebrew interlinear. Here's what the word means. The ones perceiving. The ones perceiving. 
So here's the word hachozim, and we see that it means the ones perceiving. That is a much better translation than astrologers and all that comes with that particular word. Because when the average Christian hears the word astrologer, they have a completely different perception of what that means. Like you see here on this meme, anything about astrology, oh, it's bad. Using astrology is playing God. Right? That's what they think. Astronomer is much better, but that's not exactly correct either. Remember Job, when speaking of Hashem, he said, Which alone spreadeth out of the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Those are terms used in astrology. So Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible. Some say it's the oldest book, possibly so. But he probably didn't use those particular zodiac names. Okay? Well, isn't the zodiac the zodiac? No, it's not. In Egypt, down the Nile from where I was in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, is a place called Dendera. In this temple, they found a different kind. Of zodiac. This one used various Egyptian gods, but the 12 major signs were still in the correct order. 12 is a very interesting number in Judaism. But this one in Egypt isn't the oldest one that we know about. The Chaldeans had one that even predates that. This is it here. It's commonly believed that theirs is the oldest type of zodiac in existence. The Mayans even had their own type of zodiac. So there were different signs or symbols that were used by different civilizations. So it goes to reason that there very well may have been a Judaic cycle that was used with its own symbols, and most likely it predates all of them. It would, wouldn't it? Well, one has been found, okay? But the one that's found was 6th century. But there's no telling if it comes from one that is much older than that. This is the one that was found. It was discovered in a synagogue in Beit Aleph, Israel. You can see it, in it the Mishnaic Hebrew uh, script that's being used. Notice it even has the twins, which Job talks about, Gemini, right? There they are, right there. But this is a Jewish one, not the other. So I'm relatively sure that Job used the original Hebrew names, but later a scribe translated them into their Greek names. That's happened before, right? We read in the Old Testament about the month of Tammuz. Do you really think that's what the Jews called it? I doubt it. Tammuz was a, a pagan uh, god. So somewhere down the line, one of you know, the Old Testament is, it, itself is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Somewhere down the line, someone used the Greek names. So it's not uncommon. It's not unheard of. So the Magi were quite well trained in the study of the stars. We know that. So here in chapter 2 of Matthew, we see that the Mashiach has come. That's what we read in Matthew 2, right? This is his first coming. As I'm sure you are all aware, the vast majority of Jews today say the Mashiach has not yet come. Correct? Okay. But are they being truthful or informed about this? What if I could show that according to their own works that the, that the Hasidim believe in, and even some Orthodox, some Orthodox also believe, they say that it, these works have merit, what if I could show them that these works say that the Mashiach 
has already come. Regardless of who it is, if I could just show that there is proof in any of their works that a Messiah has already come and that it's not been refuted, not like Bar Kokhba, right? They refute, they say, oh, they even call him now Ben uh, Kispa. Ben Kispa, which means son of a lie, right? So they've denounced him and said he's not the Mashiach, right? But in other words, like Bar Kokhba, who now they say was a false Messiah, call him in Bar Kispa. But if I could show them one who was never denounced, then at the very least I could say to them, well, according to a work that you believe in, it says the Mashiach has already come. Not only that, but that he was born in Bethlehem. Hmm? I'm not saying that this is about our Yeshua. I kind of think it is, but we'll, we'll talk about it near the end of this. But it's enough to say that a Messiah was born in Bethlehem very close in time to our Yeshua. Not exactly, but still first century. To do that, we have no further to look than the Talmud. Not just the Bavli, not just the Babylonian Talmud, but also in the Yerushalami, the Jerusalem Talmud. Two different works. Now, it's kind of an odd story, but it has remnants of truth. This is from the Jerusalem Talmud in the Tractate Brachot. This is straight out of the Talmud. It talks about an Arab who tells a Jew that the Messiah is born. His father's name is Hezekiah, and he will be named the Comforter, the Nachum in Hebrew. Selling his cow and his plow, the Jew buys some swaddling cloth and travels from town to town. He travels to where? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, where the child is born. All the women are buying their children clothing except Comforter's mother. She says her son is an enemy of Israel because he's born on the day that the second temple was destroyed. Now we have a time frame, don't we? Second temple period. Now, she says it's, he's an enemy of Israel. Okay. He tells her that if she does not have money today, she can pay later. When he returns, she tells him that the Comforter has been carried by a divine wind up to heaven. Well, if he was really an enemy of Israel, why would he be going to heaven? Right? And then it says, he will, she said, he will return later as Israel's Messiah. Now, remember, the Talmud, like the Bible, is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. I do think this is referring to Yeshua originally. But they're not going to believe that. I tell that to the Hasidim, they're not going to believe that, right? But I certainly can point out some remarkable coincidences here, can't I? Now, I'm sure they try to develop a, a response most likely, they say it was an interpolation, an addition that was inserted. But that would be a very tough argument for them. Interpolations are generally a small change or small insertion. Like the account that says Herod killed all the babies. Right? It's a very small insertion in the New Testament text. But this, this is an entire story. It has some girth. Also, when one has a second account that gives credence to the other, well, then you got a problem, don't you? Because it's verified. This is in the Bavli. There is a list there, and it gives various possible messiahs. And Comforter, the son of Hezekiah, is listed as one of them. Let's read it here. Apropos to the Messiah, the Gemara asks, what is his name? One, the school, one of them, the school of Rabbi Shalas says, Shiloh is his name. The Messiah is, is Shiloh. Until when Shiloh shall come. The school of Rabbi Yenay says, no, Yenon is his name. 
as it is stated, may his name endure forever. May his name continue. Get it? Get on. As long as the sun and may men bless themselves by him. Now a different school, the school of Rabbi Hanina says Hanina is his name. As it is stated, for I will show you no faith. Here's a list of a bunch of different possible messiahs. And some say that Menachem ben Hezekiah is his name. Two different works saying that this guy could be the messiah. Right? Because the comforter, Menachem, that should relieve my soul is far from me. And the rabbis say the leper of the house, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi is his name. Indeed, our illnesses he did bear, and our pains he endured. Yet we did esteem him injured, stricken by God, and afflicted. This Messiah, the uh, Menachem ben Hezekiah, has never been recanted. It's never been recanted. Who would dare? So I say to them, don't ask me to recant my Messiah, who lived in the second temple period when you haven't recanted yours. Right? Now, let us turn to a predominantly Christian error. Good grief. <laughs> Sounds like he's possessed. <laughs> <laughs> So not only a Christian error, but predominantly a Christian error. And I believe you'll be able to pick this out on close examination. It is taught by some or most Christian commentators that Numbers 24, 17 is a reference to Matthew 2, verse 2, this verse we're looking at. They write that this is the same star being referenced in both instances. Well, who can tell me why that isn't so? Let's read it. Numbers 24, 70. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheth. Matthew 2, 2. And ask, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to, reference, have come to worship him. So let's say they're talking about the same star here. What's the problem with that? One star is a person. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. They're mixing two kinds of stars here, aren't they? One is a physical star. The other is an allegorical star, which means it's a person. The star of Matthew 2, 2 is the sign of the Son of Man. The star coming out of Yaakov is talking about Yeshua himself, not his sign. You don't want to mix or confuse the two. Keep them straight. Well, then, is there anything in Jewish writings that talks about a star as a sign to the coming of the Mashiach? Because if so, that would also be of great interest in any dialogue with Hasidics and some Orthodox, wouldn't it? Like this one. The King Messiah shall be revealed in the land of Galilee. Well, that's already quite interesting, isn't it? And lo, a star in the east shall swallow up seven stars in the north, and a flame of red fire shall be in the firmament six days. That's quite interesting, isn't it? This is found in the Zohar. There are some possible elements of truth to this. Yeshua was revealed in the Galilee, wasn't he? That's where he was revealed, in Caesarea Philippi. When he was born, there was an asterisk. What is an asterisk? It could be a comet, but it could also be a planet. Right? You guys remember the sign of the Son of Man? Asterisk can mean a planet. Not a star. The sign of the Son of Man that came from the east. They both come from the east. That's also quite the coincidence. Right? Now, did it destroy seven other asterisks as it came through? I don't know. Maybe. Seven comets, maybe. 
Was there a red flame that lingered? I don't I never read about that before. I didn't read about that in the New Testament. Let's look at another passage. Here's another. When the Messiah shall be revealed, there shall rise up, where? In the east, a certain asterisk. Certain asterisk, flaming with all sorts of colors, and all men shall see it. Again, from the Zohar. So again, don't tell me that I can't believe in a Messiah that was announced by an asterisk from the east when your own holy book teaches the exact same thing. Right? Well, we can't trust the Zohar. No, we don't, but the Hasidics do. And it may even be true because I know the adversary was there when it happened the first time. So I always prefer to show truths to others from their own books. Okay? But do we have any rabbinic sources that are more reliable concerning stars that can be related to announcing a birth? Yes, we do. In the Sefer HaAgadah, another rabbinic writing, it says this. When our father Abraham was born, a what? An asterisk rose from where? In the east. And swallowed four stars in the four corners of heaven. So they believe that a heavenly body will come to announce the coming of someone very, very important. And if they believe in the Zohar, then they believe an asterisk will announce the Mashiach. There's yet another reference. This is said in the prayer of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, a second century rabbi, which is quite remarkable. A what? Shall appear from where? The east, and on top of it a rod of fire like a spear. The non-Jewish nations will claim this star, this asterisk, is ours. But it is not so. Rather, it pertains to Israel. Huh. There's a few interesting parts in this, isn't there? An asterisk will appear. Non-Jews will say it's all about them. But it's not for them, it's for the Jews. Christians have appropriated the star over Bethlehem for over 1,800 years. They think it's all about them. They think it's theirs. They think the sign of the Son of Man is also all about them too. They think the sign is the second coming itself. It's not. It's a sign telling that the event is soon to come. It's not the event itself. But they think the whole thing, the sign and the second coming, is all about them. But it's not. It's for Israel. If one is not a part of Israel, it ain't for them. They personalize large portions of the Bible even when it's not about them. There is another heavenly body talked about in the Midrash. Remember in Hebrew, a star doesn't necessarily mean a star, but it can it could also include an asteroid or planet. This reference is about when it appears in the last days. Specifically, it says that. And so also, at the end days, a star shall arise in the east. Here we see the same thing over and over again. Star arises from the east, don't we? And it is the star of the Mashiach. It says that. As it says, and there shall be a ruler, Yer, amidst Yaakov. Rabbi Yossi said, in the language of the Arameans, the east is called Yer. And it spent, this is kind of interesting, and it spends 15 days in the east, talking about the when the when Yeshua, when the Messiah comes in the last days. If it tarries even longer, it says, it is only for the good of Israel. And then you may expect the footsteps of the Messiah. 
Huh. They're talking about the sign of the Son of Man there. I think they may have had some understanding. There's an asterisk in the last days in this writing. It's connected to the Mashiach. It comes from the east, right? There's a really good chance that the sign of the Son of Man will come again from the east. That's how it came the first time. It stands to reason that's how it's going to come the second time. Rabbi? Yes. Could, could, that, could we make like an association when Yeshua was... After he rose, he was like 40 days. Um, no, I think we're going to make this an association with the last days, because that's what they're saying. Okay. They're saying this happened in the last days. But there seems to be a similarity. In a there is. Yeah, because, I mean, there okay. is. There is. Like, it, it hovered before it went on to... There is, an, and it could be. It could be. But they're, I'm just going with what they're saying. Okay. They're saying this happens in the last days. So there is a very strong implication that how long it takes to get here, that it may have a variable if it tarries. If it tarries. Let's look at the prophetic timeline. We see the first three and a half years, right, in Daniel's seven-year period. It's great revival. You guys remember that, right? So here you have the first three and a half years. The second three and a half years right here, that's divided, isn't it? Between trib and wrath. Everybody remember that part? Do you also remember there's a variable here? Right? This is when we get caught away, right? But we don't know. It says if we do everything we're supposed to do, then tribulation will be shortened. If we don't, it could be extended. There is definitely a variable there. What if that's what it's talking about? If it's correct. If it's right. It's divided between tribulation and wrath. What did I say was between those two? A variable. There is a good chance that this is what it's talking about here. It could be something else. But there is a really good chance that it's talking about that variable. Granted, it could also simply mean if the last days, it could just mean that if the last days as a whole, they tarry. Or that the coming of the Mashiach tarries. But look what it says. It says, and it spends 15 days in the east. It's talking about the sign of the Son of Man. Specifically here. Coming from the east for 15 days. It's talking about that asterisk here. This could very easily be a direct reference to the sign of the Son of Man. Now, do we know that this writing here, do we know that it's 100% from Hashem? No. But neither do we know if this is 100% from the adversary either. Or a mix of the two. But I will tell you this. If I was living in the last days, and I see the sign of the Son of Man coming... I'm going to remember that whole bit about 15 days. I'll also be looking to see if it swallows four of something or another. Or if it's flaming with all sorts of colors. Or if a flame of red fire shall be in the firmament for six days. I'm just going to keep my eye on it. Just in case. Because these passages are all correct about one thing. An asterisk will be coming in the last days. At the very least, the very least, I can show this to, us, to, to the Hasidics and say, look, we also believe in an asterisk coming in the last days. Think about that. So the Magi show up. This is years after Yeshua was born, right? We know that. It wasn't days after because he was already a little boy. There's a bunch of evidence showing this. it took him years to get there. We have a whole series on the Magi. Who they were, where they come from. Ouch. How many uh, 
how many there were that came? Does anybody remember that? Thousands. 20,000, right? We talked all about that in the series. They traveled with their army. Multiple sources say that. Their army at that time was numbered at 20,000. The Magi are also referenced in multiple works, even ones that aren't, uh, even ones that are secular. But Philo also talks about the Magi. He had something to say about them. He wrote this, Among the Persians, there exists a group, the Magi, who investigating the works of nature for the purpose of becoming acquainted with the truth, initiate others in the divine virtues by very clear explanations. Sounds like a pretty good review. Doesn't sound very negative. Okay. So some reading this may have a misunderstanding. Just because the Magi investigated the works of nature doesn't mean they're like the Wiccas or something. Okay. We also investigate nature here at Bay of Anu. The whole series on the sign of the Son of Man is an investigation of the works of nature. Okay? And that's just one of the things about nature that we investigate. There's many others. Understanding the times and the seasons, it's also connected to nature. One could study a lifetime concerning, concerning eco-theology. That's what that's called, eco-theology. But back to the Magi. I'm going to put forth a very real possibility. This would be a Shamanite approach. All the Magi may not have been only men. Okay? I mean, I bet you every one of you sitting here assumed it was all men. Okay? It's even probable that there were women in that party. One, they traveled as an army, so the women would have been safe. Two, the Magi believed at that time, when they went to go get Yeshua, that they were going to Israel to rescue the baby king. Right? But then Yosef told them they had other plans, so the Magi left quietly via a different route. But when obtaining a child, it would be prudent to have multiple women available to help with the care of that child, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. They were wise men, right? Three, it wasn't unusual for women leaders to present gifts or tribute to other kings. When the queen of Sheba visited Solomon, do you know what she did? She gave him three gifts. Three gifts. Bet you didn't know that. It says in 1 Kings 10, 10, and she gave the king 120 talents of what? Gold. Gold, large quantities of Spice. spices, and precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. At least two out of three of those are the exact same gifts given to Yeshua by the Magi. Possibly all three. Okay, I want to look in the future at more of the texts of Matthew and see if gems might be mentioned in any of them. All right? Take a lot of time, I'm still going to do it. So here we see a woman giving these virtually same gifts to Solomon. But doesn't Matthew say that, that they were men? In English, yeah. But you may remember that in Hebrew, if you have, say, for example, a hundred women in a group, but then just one man shows up, the words are changed into the masculine form, aren't they? All our Hebrew students know this. That's right. In the teaching I did on the Magi, I also said that Daniel had established that school, the school of the Magi. I said then, I didn't know how these Magi knew 
that the sign would accompany the arrival of Yeshua. I said it could have been that Hashem just revealed it to that school at that time, just told the Magi, this is it, this is it. go look for the asterisk. That's one possibility I mentioned. The other that I mentioned, I said it could have been that he revealed it to them or that Hashem had told Daniel, good grief. Nobody knows that we're having service now. A lot of people don't know, that's why. It, I said it, that Hashem could have told Daniel and that he passed it on to his Talmudim and so on. And so, you guys remember that? Passed it on from the next to the next. I didn't know which one it was. Now I know. According to Dr. Daniel Marik, he wrote this, Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, Daniel Marik, Ph.D. He wrote this translation of Hebrew Matthew. He wrote this, quote, The Magi were from El Daniya, Iraq, back then it was part of Persia, that had treasures from the prophet Daniel, whose name in Paleo-Hebrew is Daniya, and for which the city was named. It was named after him. Where he settled with treasures for service in Babylon. Records show, this is what he writes, records show that Daniya, the prophet, had put the prediction of the sign in the stars and stars and planets. When the magi of the city were to find the king and high priest of the line of David, who was to be born under this asterisk and give his offering to him. So now we know. Now we know. According to ancient sources, he had saved up treasures and said he's going to be born under this sign. So it came from Daniel. I hope you enjoyed the teaching.